just coming to organizations because you asked that question really mm-hmm. organizations got to accept the feminine style of leadership if i can use that word right mm-hmm. you can uh, have a woman in a boardroom and expect her to behave emotionally the way you would handle a conflicting situation right so there has to be, it's it is not just having women in the boardroom it's not no, not just having filling your diversity quota it's not just having okay. you know women in leadership i have two leaders or i have three leaders i had one leader okay. last time i had four it is not about that it's about how accepting how accommodating you are to a different style of leadership for which you actually got the person right okay. we get we lot of times we get people on a diversity and say and we celebrate and we we do all of that but there is a different way people react right but if you if you want only a certain style of aggressiveness only a certain style of knocking down a conversation only a certain style of operating you are not giving room for the other person to exercise what they are right so you right. have to embrace what they are psychologically as well right and the diversity cannot just stop at gender you mm-hmm. have to have inclusion of thoughts you have to respect yeah. diversity of thoughts in its true spirit Hi friends and welcome to a very exciting episode of Leading with Data. Today I have with me Matangi, Matangi Shri. She is the Chief Data Officer at UB and holds more than 100 global patents. She is one of the most influencer leaders in India specifically in BFSI in uh, AI, ML, data science, machine learning. She is also an author of two books, Practical Natural Language Processing with python and capitalizing data science and it's great to have matangi on the show she has, she has also been a speaker at data hack summit multiple times so uh, she has been very active with analytics with their community and uh, great to have you matangi thanks for taking time out uh, for the show thanks a lot kunal it's always a pleasure to interact with you and also our association goes very long with uh, analytics with you guys have been doing a a uh, great job there is not a, a technique uh, or an algorithm or a library that is not featured in analytics with you right so it's a kind of a reckoner for a lot of uh, things that people need on a regular day to day basis it's like a bible for data scientists on a ongoing basis so keep going with what you're doing thanks thanks for thank you for those kind words uh matangi i would want to start with you know your journey and how did you get into data science what were those early years with you and you have you have also experienced you know both kind of organizations a company like city which is like uh, presumably very deep to very early stage startups to uh, somewhere where the company is scaled up but the data infrastructure is unique so would love to know about your journey and and how it happened uh, to start with yeah sure uh, first thing i am very fortunate to have this journey uh, mm-hmm. you know by luck or uh, you know god's grace that i've been at right uh, situation um, as the industry was shaping from very static analysis to extremely uh, dynamic uh, decision making Right, and I had the opportunity to observe this from very close quarters. Um, I believe, and and I and I really think data is life for me because uh, all uh, it's it it will be close to twenty years in my career um, in June. Uh, I'll be completing uh, this many years being in this field, and I've seen the field kind of take that shift from where data was perceived to be. Uh, a game of uh, very static analysis so hypothesis testing and if there is a hypothesis then an analysis comes in or we want to analyze experimental results etc to what a game changing field it's been right so uh, yeah. today um, boardroom conversations are ai oriented go you know from the days where um, whether ai used to get a seat on the table is very different from today where it is happening is the board tells the founder have you what what have you done in ai okay. so huge huge shift 
um, to have seen in a you know span of two decades from where it started to uh, where it is today and i think mm-hmm. the potential of ai is immense uh, we are still scratching the uh, surface uh, we are still kind of um, you know going after what i would like to call as more automation cases but not fundamentally about optimization or lifting decision making etc there are have happening in pockets but it's still a sea change away from here but the good thing is the acceleration has begun and it will uh, lead us to much more data driven uh, future so i see overall uh, the role of data itself data science in two parts right one mm-hmm. the previous era maybe prior to 2010 2012 etc was more what i would like to call as um, human led and data data assisted right so right. it is more people made decisions and you want data to support it right yeah the post era of let's say 2012 plus onwards mm-hmm. uh, when um, things ai became my, mainstream and uh, we, we were talking about more use cases on vision voice and text then what right. has happened is it's become ai led or data science led and mm-hmm. human governed because you cannot take the human angle out of it without governance of it course. goes we have seen so many cases now where it has yeah. gone uh, all over the place so um, and uh, the journey that began for me by building risk score cards fraud models and everything uh, i mm-hmm. started then getting exposed to the world of computer science natural language processing uh, intuitive understanding of what the customer wants through fingerprinted data on web logs or fingerprinted data on apps or typed data with or what the customer says right so mm-hmm. had those exposures to craft these journeys and user experiences mm-hmm. for the end consumer to make their life better through which the revenues of the organization that are part of it have increased so that that's been my um, journey uh, konal it's been uh, like i said i'm only fortunate to see this at close quarters experience this of transitioning of an adoption of decision making from a very heuristic and a human driven paradigm to a much more data driven paradigm that we are at today interesting and uh, you know so so i have seen uh, some of the parts which you have mentioned right so when i started the uh, most of the analysis was excel and sql then then it moved to more uh, advanced tools so, so i can relate to this journey and one of the challenges which i've seen you know when, with the peer group which was there was how do you keep yourself uh, up to speed with these changes because you know for example when when machine learning came uh, and then you know you had to almost rewire your thinking in terms of how to look at the problem and then you know going from let's say someone who was very used to uh, human led analysis and data assisted to to a different paradigm how has that been for you and, and what do you think has helped you make uh, this transition if you have to reflect back on that uh see the principles of doing your job whichever field is remains the same you have to be sincere right. to what you are at. you mm-hmm. should definitely be do that only if you love doing it then you should be hard working i don't think Uh, those principles are different whether it is statistics or ml or ai or engineering or civil mm-hmm. engineering doesn't matter right so you owe it to the career that you are that you are updated and uh, you do justice uh, to the profession more importantly um, then to the organization and then to the team uh, of mm-hmm. the role that you are doing so when yeah it was a transition nevertheless having said that from yeah. statistics in fact i am not even trained in statistics so i'm trained in nothing right so uh, which is why i'm fortunate uh, i uh, when i kind of got into uh, the workforce it was especially into analytics it was more um, what ge told in our in our campus placements on what difference mm-hmm. data can make like one of the examples they gave us if you have to start a windmill data can mm-hmm. help us choose the right geographies right so that was right. been my a uh, single line that i knew about this field when i came into the field <laughs> and has wow. been after that uh, all on the job learning i'm not uh, i'm not mm-hmm. from isi or any big statistical institute so i learned statistics on the job learned mm-hmm. sas as a tool as you know on the job right. 
and then mm-hmm. when the move move to computer science uh, and uh, natural language processing etc was also on the job right one thing i'm i've been good at is if data is given to me i'll sit and read the data if it's structured data or unstructured data i'll read the data right many people don't mm-hmm. do it they right. will uh, they'll apply algorithm they'll push the data at the maximum dot head off and then you are throwing the next uh, some numpy transformation and then throwing the algorithm at it i don't do that even now for me if i understand the problem i understand the data behind the problem and i read the data so possibly mm-hmm. my shift into machine learning and the difference i could make in that came because i was having this um, ability to read data right like the discipline mm-hmm. to read data i would say not even ability and mm-hmm. uh, very uh, i kind of started this into my fundamentals of machine learning etc on the job started in 2010 or something like that mm-hmm. and uh, by the time i already started having a team so we had to work with them the team was wondering why we are reporting to her because she's not even from a computer science background right <laughs> so hence i had to prove it hard to the team that you know i can be part of your team as well right so mm-hmm. uh, and hence um, uh, you know my learning and hence my difference to the team that i used mm-hmm. to bring on to the table and claim my membership to be uh, leading that team is right. through reading data and giving insights based on what i think the data is telling and then mm-hmm. asking them to craft algorithms based on it then i learned a lot by practicing it through the team right so certain high, certain algorithm certain techniques see nlp is about techniques right mm-hmm. that is why nltk is rightfully called a toolkit it's a toolkit right. you apply one toolkit yeah. to one one another toolkit etc then you learn what works what kind of problems what granularity does not work and everything so once you know the domain and you know the data you can now figure out you are getting a grip at it i really did not know natural language processing unstructured data handling when i started having a team reporting to me who knew that very early years of corporate adoption of these techniques of course these technologies date long back so right. that is that was my way of learning it's more learning by doing learning mm-hmm. by watching someone do learning by reading data right that's mm-hmm. the beginning of the shift but i have been always good at coding um, that has been my biggest stress buster uh, you know also so i can get on to coding naturally faster so um, because i knew sas to understand r and then to shift to python was not a big shift for me right so okay. mm-hmm. uh, and i could pick up some of these at very fast time so those were my so to say membership cards to become part of the computer science community even now i i'm in somewhere in the corner of the community but i'm still part of the community i feel uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so that that's been my uh, journey but one one thing i often reflect is it's a brutal world out there when it comes to technology you mm-hmm. got to keep learning you got to be mm-hmm. on the toes all the time um the stress of learning cannot be underestimated it's a very big stress it was yeah. the older generations uh, Uh, you know used to kind of learn one technique move on to leadership roles and then after that you don't need to learn anything right correct but that's not how how technology today is you can get very easily redundant uh, of your own and you do most importantly you'll do injustice to the job injustice to the people injustice to the company the organization and the overall climate around you if you don't keep yourself updated and how much you can get updated right there are, uh, by minutes things are changing today uh, yeah. you you sleep and you wake up to a new llm getting released it's <laughs> it's, uh, it's out there um, at it but and that stress is something i think many people have to talk about it it is uh, it uh, there is a is a constant feeling of your inferior and you have to learn uh, i don't think uh, this field you can ever think you know everything right it free field always keeps you humble that way right, right. at least for mm-hmm. me i am learning humility with every technology that comes in <laughs> the only thing i know <laughs> is, is i don't true. know anything and i completely yeah. surrender to that uh, but the stress of keeping yourself updated really cannot be understated it is it is out there and the stress only builds up as you get to leadership roles because now you have teams far far more technical than you far more updated than you 
then you have to learn from them to give a guidance right okay. so and and that's that's overwhelming uh, that's exciting mm-hmm. if we can also say that um, but it is the reality whichever way it is technology leadership has to be one humble second be on the go on learning all the time and uh, in this period you also managed to write two books right and then again uh, uh, personally i have always uh, had a huge respect for anyone who has taken time to you know uh, write a book it's a huge effort so yeah. so how how did uh, that happen and how did you carve out time for uh, doing this along with the job yeah so one thing is like i said i learn by practice right so committing to a book gave me that uh, push to learn something deeper so that you can write mm-hmm. about it right so i uh, there are people like me who learn by teaching uh, learn by by being a teacher and learn by right. writing <laughs> a book so mm-hmm. that was my biggest motivation to write the book i want to write okay. the book because um i want one the first book was completely that right the, i wanted to definitely write the book because i want to get my knowledge intact because i've never learned this uh in the college or i have not ever learned it by course work i've always learned it by practice right i've always okay. learned it by serendipity i've always learned the problem first and then you figure out a solution and oh and this is how you figured out a solution always done that so book was my the first book which was on text mining which is all the classic techniques of text mining uh mm-hmm. not generative way uh, the core hardcore foundational yeah. text mining uh, yeah. was more for me to get back to the get back and learn this correctly in the right order so i thought i'll write the mm-hmm. book and commit myself to it it was through springer and apress publications so i had to make sure that my standard is also correct in those uh, books and everything that was the inspiration for the first book the second mm-hmm. one actually happened because through a bunch of conversations with vcs and founders at one point a lot of people were approaching me saying hey we're going to set up an ai uh, team but we don't understand head or to of it or there were vcs who were talking to me saying hey i'm going to fund this company but they're mm-hmm. saying they are ai how do we know it's genuine how do i even know whether um, ai makes sense or not sense etc right so all of this came to me that okay so we we'll, i i wanted to write a book for the non native data science community who have not done uh, data science as a career but who are deeply engaged with data science for their big decisions in life right i want to kind of make that uh, difference so i also wanted to make it technical i did not want to make it out on um, keep it very abstract and what are the applications of ai kind of thing but i did talk about applications but then i wanted to say okay if for this application these kind of data is what you normally find in this industry if you find these kind of data then these techniques can work this techniques cannot work how do you measure how do you do ab experiments and what are the practical challenges while you do a data science problem with these challenges that's how that book is shaped into bunch of applications but every application had data i had not exposed every code out there and codes were with me because i didn't want to i i had written for an audience who have not done coding but who had kind of want to deeply get into data science so mm-hmm. it was more numbers and discussion on numbers for each of the application with the data science problem the codes written behind this so that that was my biggest the second book my motivation was to definitely send a message out there on data science should be treated with the right amount of um, you know expectations on impacts with the right amount of understanding of not everything is research not everything is black box if you put the effort you can understand how do you measure it how do you make it extremely useful for your company and your context that was the that i thought the message has to be told from a practitioner i seen a lot of companies lot of uh, uh, you know stakeholders lot of founders from that perspective the story of data science needs to be heard um, and the story of how data science should be well leveraged for the right outcome should be told because data science is neither hardcore engineering right mm-hmm. not hardcore business the answer lies in right. the middle right a good data right. scientist is a person who kind of understands it with the business understands the data uh, understands the business problem understands reads the data like i was saying so i'll start from a data scientist 
is somebody who kind of works with business, understands the business problem, reads the data, understands uh, the contours of the data, <clears throat> right? And also is able to stay true to the machine learning foundations of data science and build a solution that is not too oversimplifying the solution itself, right? Yeah. So this mix of things and also a good presence with executives in the company to make yeah. sure data science becomes mainstream is also important, right? And this kind of message needs to be told. Really my uh, motivation, one, well, that is also the big purpose that I find in the roles that I take up. I want to mm -hmm. shift how businesses think about data, how businesses can liberate themselves by, uh, you know, using data-driven decisions. So that book kind of helped me do that. And that is something today leaders need to do, right? It is yeah. unlike, again, uh, a well-structured, let's say somebody is building an app, a well-structured engineering problem, which is a bunch of screens and then this. Data science is not that, right? You When you start the problem, you don't know the problem. Then you don't know the variables. Then you don't know the data. Then you don't know whether an intervention will make a difference or not. Then then you don't know whether you can solve the problem or not. Then after you solve the problem, then the deployment issues. come. Then you do it. Then the customers start getting evaluated through the model. Then the decisions make a difference. Then the decisions make a difference to the impact of the company. That time an attribution problem should not come in if you have not thought about AB at the beginning, right? So it's an entire journey. Uh, it's not like one fits all or we put few lines of code, import certain uh, you know libraries and then get the uh, data in a data frame and solve it. It's not that way. Possibly yeah. most of the work happens outside Jupyter Notebooks. Right? So right. And, and I think the uh, the need of that message is, is actually a lot stronger now since you've written the book and then with all the uh, you know uh, uh, discussions around gen AI and AI specifically so, so that is that is uh, uh, very true uh, the other aspect which you know stands out about your journey is, is the 100 plus patents uh, which you yeah. you know hold uh, for for someone let's say who is uh, you know uh, working as a data scientist right so uh, so what does a patent mean and okay. and you know what would the process look like and and if you have to give any advice to them if they have to think about patenting their work what would that be see the crux of it is not patent it's innovation right and when right. do you innovate Innovation is not something, okay, I'll, I run away from my current problems and then sit in one corner and think innovation, right? That's not innovation. Innovation is part of the problem. It's the problem mm -hmm. that you are solving. And if you are solving it differently, if it is really solving the problem, innovation automatically comes. Once the innovation comes, you take it to patent. It's not the reverse, right? right. And every job, every problem, uh, I began by saying we are only scratching the surface of the problem that AI can solve, right? So you have yeah, right. so much of possibilities sitting on each one's desk, sitting on each one's laptop, sitting in maybe a GB of data that is out there, right? So <laughs> much of innovation can be tapped in. If only yeah. we listen to the business problems well, if only we listen to the data well and we read the data, there is always a possibility that you could think differently and solve the problem differently for better outcomes, right? Or for better mm -hmm. user experience, for better revenues, for better cost savings, et cetera. That's how innovations come. Innovations is not something away from what we are doing. It is part of core work. And as long as mm -hmm. they imbibe it, you know, you know, you're doing well. See, the other thing, Kunal, is that way people think about their jobs, right? They think, okay, I learn if I if I ask, I normally ask people because I believe that I own the careers of people. I'm responsible for careers of people, uh, whoever mm -hmm. are working with me. And uh, hence, one of the things that I keep asking them is, how much did you learn, right? Have you learned, how, if you reflect, tell me in the last six months, how much have you learned? And general answers that come is, okay, I've been working either in the same technology or the, in a way, uh, the learning kind of gets broken down into technology, into the GBs and TBs of data that you have handled, or learning gets broken into algorithms right this is all learning gets broken but learning is far more than this right so even yeah. when 
those people who are truly innovating on a day to day to day job they don't even realize they have done something brilliant because if you are going to evaluate yourself based on uh, you know your technology or whether from uh, python you moved to pyspark or whether i used uh, you know xg boost uh, today am i am using neural network or i've used mm-hmm. neural network i have used a language model i've used language model have a built a tokenizer right if you're only going to look at a milestone to b milestone and be very fixed about learning then even when you are learning you're not even realizing you're learning right so and and everyone who are solving great problems are innovating they, yeah. they don't realize that they've innovated right because they think that something else that has to be complex innovation this is my definition of innovation should solve a problem and one quick way of knowing an innovation is it is a problem that is not getting solved but when you solve it it looks too common sense right it looks <laughs> this simple right mm-hmm. that is uh, possibly you know i'm talking about innovation that's happening in corporates i'm talking about yeah. innovation that's happening at scale right i'm not talking mm-hmm. about innovation which is happening in labs and academia etc i don't have enough, right. anything to talk like i don't know enough to talk about it mm-hmm. so if you look at innovations that's happening in day to day work they are problems that's raking your brain but once you solve it it looks like hey, it was only this that you solved it. it doesn't even look like anything why did nobody think about it right it's common sense so bulk of innovations are going to fall in this category of common sense mm-hmm. right what we need to realize is it is common sense but somebody did not realize it so it is good right and <laughs> then the patent thing comes in and you will be surprised the amount of novelty that is there and people do prior art yeah they have not talked about it and it leads into something like that a small Very feedback loop that nobody thought about it for enabling data at scale instrumentation at scale becomes an innovation but it is also valuable it is for namke was the innovation right it is valuable at solving a big deal for the company it is valuable because nobody thought about it it is valuable mm-hmm. because it's a big enough problem that's why right. you're putting also the money in patent right so uh, i think crux of all of this is innovation and we can innovate while doing our job if we are committed to the business problem at hand and committed to profession right i am saying that again because there are two classes of people either they oversimplify every problem into rules and heuristics and everything not that they should not be there that should also be mm-hmm. there for the right reasons or there are other class of people who are like i will not work other than if it is not the state of the art algorithm i'm not even going to touch this piece of code and that mm-hmm. lies in middle on how you are able to balance the business context to practicality to being committed to the profession right of making sure complexity and robustness are part of the journey so so staying true to the profession and as a outcome of that if you are solving problems the patents and innovation would come by itself yes yes interesting uh, uh just you know uh, double clicking on your current role so you are now chief data scientist at uh, uh, ub so can you tell a bit about ub what do you do and in the role which data is playing in in building this uh, uh, platform and infrastructure sure so um, ub is a, a marketplace and building the uh, lending infrastructure for the country um, we started with mm-hmm. india but we are also going global uh, so it connects uh, borrowers and lenders uh, through the platform but also deeply integrated into the both of the systems operating systems right so uh, so basically it is about also providing the infrastructure through large scale financial transactions large scale defined both as volume and as well as ticket size large scale transactions flow through this and uh, all the systems are connected and uh, hence it's building a very robust uh, lending infrastructure uh, for the country which will result in more financial inclusion so while we are building the infrastructure there are a lot of data uh, intervention so to say we plug mm-hmm. in into this journey of the customer that's why data comes in so i'm the chief data officer at uh, ub and group of companies of ub uh, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, my role spans across from instrumenting data to data engineering to uh, data science ml engineering uh, all facets of ai uh, vision voice text as well as into data governance right so it's the it's the end to end 
the picture of um, data that I get to do um, in this role. Uh, mm -hmm. And so some of the core things that we have started doing is we have mapped AI across the journey of a lending journey of a customer. So initially, if a bank has to acquire a customer, be it enterprise or be it retail, you know, there are underwriting scores available. There are cross sell models or upsell models that kind of identify the customers that are available. Mm -hmm. Then uh, let's say there are customers who are seeking a loan and they have submitted a bunch of documents. So document parsing, uh, in, which is both vision and NLP come into play. And these are large scale financial documents. So it could be your mm -hmm. balance sheet. It could be your PNL. It could be uh, which is which is multi page document. Uh, fairly unstructured, a lot of technical details in it. Um, there are a mm -hmm. lot of accounting questions that come in because do you want to put okay. this in uh, credit or do you want to put this in the debit side? This is an asset or a liability kind of things. But imagine these are images of financial documents. Then you're parsing the okay. document, then you're normalizing the data, then you're bucketing the data in right categories, then you're writing a bunch of formula on top of it to present it to an underwriter. Automatically, all of this is happening. Then there are scores that is built on top of these documents, which kind of say how credit worthy an individual is there or not. Then there's a bunch of monitoring signals, anomalies and monitoring signals that happen after the loan is dispersed. That's called that comes under the area of fulfillment. Uh, mm -hmm. Then we have an end. So any loan that is given is only so much if it is not collected back. Right. So the fundamental thing, if you have to solve for financial inclusion, you need to solve the collections. Well, then only financial inclusion can happen right so okay. um, and hence we have a big play in collections also uh, whom to collect what is the propensity to pay of the customer what is the right channel to approach a customer because you don't want to bombard the customer with all the time all the messages they're going to miss it they're going to have a negative experience with the lender so how do you make sure user experience is maintained while you're reminding the customers for collections digitally and digitally also we have multiple channels sms ivr uh, we have another interesting channel called Conversation Engine, where in local language, it could be Rajasthani, Hindi, Marathi, etc. It can talk to people even in rural rural areas, right, who are not experienced to voice board kind of conversations. It can say, I'm, I'm this person, I'm calling you from this bank and you have this much due, can I talk to you for a few minutes? The person says yes and then, says, then the person says, no, I have this problem, you know, I lost my job or... Uh, you know, they normally things we hear things like Eti Jalgai, right? Like, uh, uh, and uh, so I cannot, I will, not, we were doing this, especially in the agri sector. And then the bot accordingly reacts to it, you know, shows some level of empathy and then reminds and then say, I will again call you, etc. Right? So that's, that's one journey of the collections journey that I'm talking about. Then, then whom do you send a human uh, uh, in-person approach to? Whom do you kind of call? How is the call center experience between the agent and the customer when it comes to collection? So you can see multiple touch points of AI. And we do a full full stack on AI, vision, voice, text, and structured data across this entire journey, well backed by a data management layer. Now we have, uh, we have a central data lake uh, in which a uh, lot of open source techniques we have used to make sure um, our data is accessible, uh, but at the same time, you know, data is democratized, but it is accessed well with the right right people only will have right access to the data, etc. The core data governance principles are also managed. So that's, that's a sneak peek of things that we do at UB Data. Got it. Interesting. Very interesting. So that's that's a very wide range of uh, you know data use cases, and and you know traditionally banks would have let's say a team dedicated to each of these single problems right the, so how have you structured the team uh, under you and and what's the culture like to be uh, uh, as as part of that team so it is use case and uh, see the vision is clear you know vision is financial inclusion vision is uh, driving data through ai that is very clear right now there are and we have very good uh, you know network with the banks and then we interact with the clients on at least me and my leadership team interacts with the customers on a very frequent basis so we hear the problems from the horse's mouth and what they are going through 
adoption at the banks also i should appreciate them for some of the new age technologies including generative ai has been phenomenal right so they are looking for more such solutions that could change their life and their end customers life better so that way these are not boxed teams so to say uh, but and and kunal generative ai has only put more tools in a data scientist armor right so that way there is so much of excitement even in the team to take up the new use cases you know solve these big problems um, for example one of our generative ai solution right is about uh, um, uh, like generating credit information reports which are multi page documents around with public data which could be 1000 plus signals about the con- company right so you get 1000 plus signals and then you get a report of uh, 10 plus Uh, documents across multiple sections summaries recommendations whether somebody should invest in the company or not all written by generative ai so this is one use case we are ground up and cracking we take feedback from financial analysts on this reports so that it has to be match a cas caliber of writing this so that's an right. exciting problem that any data scientist would like to get on and for that right. there are toolkits on language models we are also fine tuning it for this case but you also need to understand financials analysis you need to understand how to work with the language models you need to know where you will not do heavy prompt engineering to where you will where you will do anomalies and give it to the algorithm where you will stay away from it and let the algorithm tease out the anomaly so it's that way i think it's been exciting for us to understand these problems and then start solving for them i i feel a lot of times like a kid in a candy store right with all of these uh, problems and Uh, yeah. people talking about it vfsa is a data rich place and uh, with the with the new things that has got created with generative ai right uh, there is a lot of positive vibe and energy uh, from uh, the cxo levels in banks to start using these technology for betterment of either their own employees is so if, if mm-hmm. uh, generative ai starts writing financial reports then the turnaround time for some of these reports can come down and hence the lending can become faster their customers lives can get better right so this huge understanding is very appreciative for banks to have and they are really taking on to this technology there are problems to be solved there are always the last mile right. problems to be solved is my data going out the data in what is happening what what happens when one language model changes to another language model tomorrow how will your model learn all of that is fine right but see any time you have a problem you understand the problem it is 60% of the problem solved now the next 40% yeah. is execution right to find yeah. a problem to solve is the biggest problem <laughs> right so i think yeah. this wave that way is exciting that it is throwing those problems at you whoever is going to catch it and solve the problem is going to kind of take the pie uh, you know of of the market share on this and uh, specifically on that problem uh what is your experience with hallucinations because you know for example mm-hmm. all the documents you are working on uh, they are very fact based and uh, absolutely and if you are creating some these one of the common problems is you get into hallucinations and then the uh, model starts creating data on its own or, or you know correlating data points which uh, may not be correlated so so uh, Uh, what has been your experience and and how uh, difficult and are there any methodologies which have like worked for you to to address this to some degree so uh, we have been trying this problem for a long time now now close to one year we have stayed with this problem right mm-hmm. uh, we have also solved we have also had some milestones etc initially we tried fine tuning we tried uh, the reinforcement learning approach uh then we tried some level of rags based approach to control the hallucination right. um mm-hmm. more than fine tuning what is working for us is while well, right, two two layers right you need to divide the problem in two layers first mm-hmm. layer sometimes you should not throw all the data at the model you have to do okay. some feature crunching at your end right okay. and then okay. you prompt it well and then you that is one that is certainly a way to control hallucination of course mm-hmm. some of these hallucination is also inherent to the language model type some of them do well right. some of them hallucinate etc but if we can do these two things right contain it with some level of feature engineering before you go to the model right uh, and the context windows also are not many right so you, you cannot write too many instructions to the model right 
So then you divide the problem into chunks of summaries. Then you do one final summary on it. So multi-level handling of data and multi-level handling of language models is kind of helping us solve the problem. Very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, and uh, uh, just uh, you know, double clicking on generative AI as a as a field and its impact on uh, uh, BFSI specifically. Uh, hmm. How do you see, let's say, next uh, two to three years? What are some of the things which you are looking forward to? And within BFSI, if you have to pick, let's say, one or two use cases where you see the biggest impact coming from generative AI, what would those be? See, BFSI, the biggest impact always comes in two buckets, right? Either while you're funding the loan or you're collecting the loan. Right? In in banks, I'm sorry. Uh, in, yeah. in insurance, we can talk about separately. So, yeah. in, in bank and financial sector, you have to, you're either giving money or taking money back. Only two big activities are happening, right? Of course, treasury and all of that is separate. So, you should be either of this to make a big, big impact. Either you should do something with mm -hmm. generative AI in collection or you should do something while lending. We have picked pick the first one. We are also having our use cases on collections, etc. I told you about the conversational engine and everything. Right. But they are not large scale summaries. My large scale summaries is at the initial sourcing level. So this is one part of it. Insurance on the claim side on, uh, you know, what we can understand about a user's claim, the questions it can ask, the uh, answers, uh, you know, users can throw uh, depending on the claim documents and the document price processing is going to be a big layer. And that's also going to from insurance it will also move to healthcare right so healthcare is also going to get really shaken up uh, with uh, generative ai in retail for things that we have not seen right yeah so those those would uh, definitely happen more and more processes in banks even today you won't imagine the amount of documents somebody process to your loan right maybe a simple small ticket size of personal loan you get in a click of a button you might even there there's documents you upload bank statements or you upload your salary slip and then somebody takes a decision like some engine takes a decision on it and gives it right but as the loan ticket sizes increases there are more documents your pnl your balance your balance sheet or uh you know bank statements your any other income proofs your assets all of that land records right things get read and then a decision is made so there's so much of applications right how do you write your application like you they give you a form and then you type it or you write it very common use cases among uh things that you submit as an identity proof right whether your pan mm -hmm. card other card voter card whether you submitted the right card whether there's a tampering in that car in that in what you submitted uh your passports we are talking global markets we are talking about passports that are across the geos with different types and and things like that those are those are big processes that banks have right they have yeah. manual team that is doing it just that just automating that is going to be a big win right automation mm -hmm. to a greater level the next followed yeah. by summaries to make these decisions and then the final mm -hmm. decision itself right this is one stack that's linearly is going to move and going to move more Non-linearly, your marketing campaigns, you know, uh, dialing outbound caller, but bot enabled outbound callers on how customers have to be interacted with, etc. is going to happen. Physically also, like, you know, uh, when uh, when the when the customers come to the bank in India, it's kind of reduced. But again, in rural areas, it is still there. Large ticket sizes require a visit to the bank. I think there can be some uh, enhancements out there, right? Uh, in the I I am I am saying in underwriting collections a lot of innovations is going to happen in those the area of automation summarization and decision making on underwriting is going to be big in collections how you interact with the customers when an in person person is going to like there's a field agent who is talking to a customer yeah there's a conversation that is happening right and this is Correct. happening in natural setting you won't believe when we build the conversational engines. The mm -hmm. maximum problem we had was with background noise because people are picking up the call, putting it on speaker. They are next to a farm. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that is very different from a conversation like we are having, right? It's a controlled Correct. room. Uh, there is no <laughs> background noise, right? It's very, and it's fully in English, right? Correct. So with now these are the localized flavor of these languages will have to come in. 
and will play a big role and that will play a big role in any interaction that is happening between an agent and a customer i am also saying it will get extended to field collections also which is a huge part of the collection industry today that will also get transformed mm -hmm. with these uh, technologies wow so uh, and personally purely from you know domain uh, growth so, so generative ai as a field in itself uh, what are some of the things you are looking forward to in the next few years speech will be top of my order uh, mm -hmm. speech local languages right okay. uh, languages like arabic uh, which are mm -hmm. not so much trained on there are models for each of these also right. uh, mix of language the arabic also has multiple dialects right so the answer lies in large language model solving for localized use cases right mm -hmm. which is uh, which could be the things the flavors can be in this format right it could be yeah. um, different local languages dialects code mixing which is starting in one language ending up in another language those kind of things speech we want to see the big big movement happening in speech our transcription services even the best of the guys are not at uh, great word error rates so word error rates are still big it's a, of the order of uh, 60% word error rate mm -hmm. is 60% which means 40% is correct right so any application that is getting built on asr today has practical see there may be a very well trained corpus in which the word error rates are very less right i'm talking about regular conversations conversations that drive business value conversations that are not in urban setup conversations that happen in uh, you know in bharat right in that uh, the bharat yeah. market that they call right so in 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 uh, in those areas is where we want to see that one because that is taking your ai to the last mile right and you solve for okay. it you are solving for billions of people that's the scale you will unlock if you solve that so those are yeah. some of the things i'm expecting it to come through uh, we'll also have to take thinking uh, nlp for example only from an english context right we think internet in english we think nlp in english but the world to be tabbed lies absolutely outside of it outside <laughs> of english that is true yeah. that is true interesting and uh, 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 in terms of uh, uh, specifically vision any particular uh, you know application which you would uh, so so document ai is probably one which you yeah. kind of yeah. uh, uh, clearly focused on any other application from vision even on document i am saying multi page uh large scale very deep financial documents that is what we are trying to crack right deep <laughs> domain financial documents multi page documents um this is what we are we are trying to that is where our maximum energy is focused uh, to solve that problem of <laughs> course we ki we kind of uh, one of the problems we got recently challenged is hey this is a statement that got printed from dot matrix what would be your uh, uh, accuracy <laughs> on this now you actually okay. take that dot matrix printer it's been scanned correctly only so it's not like they are scanned like this or anything they scanned correctly okay but you try mm -hmm. reading a dot matrix printer uh, output it's not easy okay humans okay. cannot read it, right yeah <laughs> <laughs> it true. it is very hard and now you somebody took a picture of it and then you are trying to read it right so mm -hmm. it it takes a lot of zooming and then thinking and you know some level of uh, language model internally built you know human built la <laughs> yeah, our own language uh, sometimes you read a l l e and then you can think it it's apple right that kind of a language right. model i'm talking about right so oh. it needs that so i think in vision those will be the areas to unlock it will be mm -hmm. even in documents right again other than there are other images government is going big on video I, i'm talking again from a yeah. bfsa uh, perspective okay. so videos mm -hmm. how do you uh, process videos how do you check liveliness through videos how do you do your ckyc um, through videos and that uh, part has to be untapped i think in insurance this will play again a bigger role because you can do proofs of claim either through images or through video so that's it's going to that's already happening and it I think it will only mm -hmm. um, accelerate uh, some of this uh, paces uh, those are off the uh, head i'm saying like what are the things that we can do this could be my top of the mind uh, things on vision sure uh 
uh, you know, uh, with uh, Women's Day just around uh, the corner, right? Uh, yeah. uh, how do you feel? Because again, uh, it's a fact that, uh, you know, uh, when you look at uh, diversity mix in AI and ML, the, uh, uh, you know, the percentage yes. could be anywhere between, let's say, 15 to 30, 35, but that's that's usually uh, where most of the organizations would be. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on it and anything which, uh, you know, uh, can accelerate this or change this and let's say in coming years, which you think can be an initiative from a community perspective? See, one thing is society at large, right? Organizations are only can have so much impact on it. Correct. Organizations mm-hmm. also can do something about it. But first thing, mm-hmm. the, it starts with the individual. And the individual is formed by the society. So I would say from the society, uh, how I, we should be accepting about women having hard jobs, right? This is a hard job. I, yes. I explain. Yeah. learning is always yeah. on the go. And you're always stressed about you have not learned enough, right? right. So the societies have to get more accepting. Uh, children in school, it starts there have to be encouraged to do more coding, more technical learning, have to be encouraged into a lot of technology and STEM education. Families have to support that. And if there's a daughter in the family, she learns from the mother, right? So if the mother can only preach so much, if the mother herself is not in the workforce, right? So sometimes, yeah. but the, the reverse also happens sometimes, right? The mother who is in the who is not in the workforce tells the daughter that, look, don't be like me. Uh, because you have right. to be in the i'm telling this with the right judgment i'm uh, of course i have a lot of respect for people stay at home moms and everybody yeah. but those who have regrets i'm talking about they could tell the daughters that look you know you could also you should uh you know pursue a career and you should be stay at the top of the daughter list and sometimes the reverse happens the mothers mm-hmm. who are at work and who are you know long uh work, hard hours long hours hard job end up telling their uh daughters saying that or don't take a job like mine, you know, so you lose out on life. And that changes the next generation far more than anything else changes. And you'll be surprised at the impression on a child when a mother speaks like this, right? So a mm-hmm. lot of women have to take in their hand. They have to mm-hmm. stop blaming people around saying because of them, you know, I'm not able to do certain things. You have to be grateful about people who are supporting you without without a support. Nobody can work, men or women, right? It's, it's, it's yeah. there. Just that for women, it is more a headwind and for men, it's more a tailwind. So society looks men to work. Society looks at women, when is she going to stop working? It has been already so many years into the career. What else you want, right? But mm-hmm. it is also self. It is also being right. ambitious. It is also being, you know, you want to have a, you want to see a purpose in your profession. Mm-hmm. That is very, very important. And that will get more women in the workforce. Seeing more women, more, more women will come in. Uh, girls will get, the young children growing up, will get inspired to see their mom occupying center stage somewhere. So it's it's a cycle and that's more mm-hmm. sustainable. Just coming to organizations, because you asked that question, really mm-hmm. organizations got to accept vim, feminine style of leadership, if I can use that word, right? Mm-hmm. You can't uh, have a woman in a boardroom and expect her to behave emotionally the way you would handle a conflicting situation, right? So there has to be, it's, it is not just having women in the boardroom. It's not, no, not just having, filling your diversity quota. It's not just having, you know, women in leadership. I have two leaders or I have three leaders. I had one leader last time. I had four. It is not about that. It's about how accepting, how accommodating you are to a different style of leadership for which you actually got the person, right? We get we lot of times, we get people on a diversity and say, and we celebrate and we, we do all of that. But there is a different way people react, right? But if you if you want only a certain style of aggressiveness, only a certain style of knocking down a conversation, only a certain style of operating, you're not giving room for the other person to exercise what they are, right? So you right. have to embrace what they are psychologically as well. Right. And the diversity cannot just stop at gender. You Mm -hmm. have to have inclusion of thoughts. You have to respect diversity of thoughts in its true spirit. 
then Correct. you are putting lesser blockers otherwise a lot of times women feel it's a man's world out there a lot of people mm -hmm. whoever is watching this is going to resonate with this statement right Correct. it will resonate that many times you feel it's a man's world out there because i'm not if you uh, you know for example if i get emotional if my voice raises if i break down if i cry in front of others it's fine it's a way of reaction like how however some you know another my my colleague who's a uh, uh, you know male could react very differently they may raise their voice they may uh, you know be very hard they may be talking more fat than i'm talking about feeling but both are fine right it's not one no, versus no. the other both are needed right. both are needed for a healthy organization to thrive and seeing such women leaders more women leaders will come in and also a request to women leaders that i am making don't change yourself be unabashedly you that's why you are there yeah. okay. once it's you go good. there for acceptance if you change yourself and you don't speak up then you're not inviting more people like you to be there right yeah. so have the odds face that make the way for other women and to come into workforce and eventually to leadership very 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 powerful uh, and then yeah i think uh, the point you mentioned that it has to be diversity of thoughts which has to be encouraged it's clearly yeah. you know uh, the thing right uh, uh, mathan towards the end of uh, these podcasts i usually do a few rapid fire questions sure sure please guests, please right yeah sure so, sure uh, uh, any uh, books which had huge impact on you or or books which you would recommend to the listeners technical books i don't read i i learn by practice uh, so sure. i kind of uh, read books more fiction which have mm -hmm. life changing messages and possibly more leadership uh, from that perspective so per se you know just saying that be more open to fiction i don't have an advice to say because <laughs> fiction sure. also teach you more leadership lessons the than imagination and the, yeah, yeah. and also leadership yeah. lessons right how somebody handles a situation could yeah. uh, biographies and things like that could really make you a better leader and in any particular book which had a, a big impact on you different types uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know different stages i have uh, read about uh, because you're just asking the first book that flash time telling you it's not the only book mm -hmm. i had uh, read mm -hmm. a book about uh, prime minister pv narasimhao on um, okay. how he had uh, handled the 1991 crisis in india and how he had set forth an entire economic uh, change uh, within india and what was the child and how he handled those challenges I think that mm -hmm. just came to me once you said a book right so that would okay. that's, right. that's possibly there interesting interesting and uh... what what kind of uh, uh, person are you are you morning person a late night no. person <laughs> depends on what the work demands uh, left okay. to my preference uh, i would say both but left to my preference uh, i kind of can stay up late okay and uh, uh, which payment app do you use personally i see i have led the data science teams at phone pay very close to that <laughs> <laughs> okay interesting and uh, now uh, you know open source versus uh, proprietary models which which one do you uh, uh, absolute hands down open, open source oh, open source <laughs> simply because you get so much of support and help mm -hmm. than than ever you would you can even imagine proprietary tools they won't even come close right uh, what would a uh, uh, ideal holiday look for you for how ideal holiday you saying yeah <laughs> first with my daughter and my husband so if we take uh, we are also very temples or history people or uh, you know and, okay uh, we all we take a lot of city holidays and we have a bunch of destinations we meet all of that it's a very very busy holiday if it's But not busy I, by the sound of it 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 may be even ad hoc planned a day before or one week okay. before depending on visa and things like that but mm -hmm. it is it has to be hectic for me so that, to keep me away okay. from the work so mm -hmm. yeah and uh, yeah there's a lot of good memories we create my daughter's curiosity and 
you know learning about a place with her mm-hmm. is what mm-hmm. i look forward to great great thanks thanks for sharing that uh, something any last pieces of uh, you know advice anything which we didn't touch upon in the conversation which you would want to share so i'm i'm not to uh, be giving the space of suggestion to only women i'm telling to everyone uh, today getting mm-hmm. into the field of technology right and uh, it's a huge amount of young generation coming into the technology my mm-hmm. word of advice to them for long careers work hard right there is no yeah. substitute for hard work be very open to learning both technical and non technical technical has to be a huge part of learning but then in a company you learn other things as well about people which a medium post cannot for example give it right <laughs> so yeah. be open to learning be at it and do hard work more importantly ask yourself what's your purpose you figure out a purpose purpose will gu- guide a life right so figure out the purpose as early as possible the purpose guides your rest of the life and be very truthful to that purpose purpose could be you know data ai or purpose could be much much larger than that purpose could be launching a rocket right purpose could be uh, you know running the country a day whatever is your purpose but find the purpose and just work hard at it because not everyone gets a purpose in life and be just grateful for it mm-hmm. thanks thanks for sharing that thing and once again thanks for you know taking time out uh, of your schedule and sharing those insights anecdotes stories and and the uh, experience so thanks a lot no thanks kunal it's been a pleasure uh, talking uh, to you on this we covered a lot of deep topics a lot of deeply technical topics also so I, i'm very uh, glad for this conversation thanks thanks